This video is going to be the most complete beginner guide for Diablo 4 that has been made. By the time you finish this video, you will understand every system you need to know to get started. If you've got questions, ask them in the comments down below. I'll read and respond to every single one. Yeah, I'm weird like that. Also, be sure to take advantage of the timestamps in the description to revisit any topic that you need to come back to later. All right, first thing that you're gonna do is create a character. You'll be presented with this screen right here and you'll have a couple of options. One is to change your world here. You can choose the difficulty and we're gonna go over those. But basically to start, the first thing you need to know is that there's Adventurer, which is going to be your easy mode, which is gonna be something you can play with a light challenge up to level 50. And there's gonna be Veteran, same thing. It's gonna be slightly harder. You're gonna get 20% more experience and monsters are gonna drop 15% more gold. This is not a significant amount of experience or gold, especially if you're not super experienced with Diablo, you might be killing things 20% slower. So that 20% gain in experience is a wash, right? So definitely try out veteran for the increased experience and the increased gold and also for the increased difficulty because you know adventure may be way too easy for you and it might not be quite as fun okay first things first you're going to be able to create your character this is the character creation screen right here you're going to be presented with the option to create a new character if you already have a character it'll be listed below that and then if you choose your character and hit start game it starts the game so let's go over what creating a new character is like you're going to be able to choose between the five classes presently in the game you've got your barbarian and as it tells you here it's a powerful warrior who relies on brute force to subdue their enemies barbarians are able to swap between an array of powerful weapons during combat ensuring that they are prepared for any situation you're going to have berserking which is going to channel your inner rage to enter and maintain the berserking state increasing your damage and movement speed basically the berserking is a buff that increases your damage by roughly 25 percent you have a lot of abilities that give you this buff and you're going to try to have it up as much as possible because that's a massive damage buff and then there's some passives that even take that percentage higher later on you're going to have the ability to bleed enemies which is just a massive dot that hurts them over time you're going to have your walking arsenal become a walking arsenal gaining damage and other bonuses for using various weapons in combat this means that when you kill something with a weapon you're going to actually level that weapon up this is the only class that basically has a level tree for each weapon where you can level them up and unlock passives and then when a weapon hits level 10 it unlocks a very powerful passive we'll go over that more in depth when we get into the section where we go over classes then you've got unbridled rage the pinnacle of aggression you have an increased fury cost to use skills in exchange your skills are dramatically more powerful and that's pretty self-explanatory then you've got the necromancer necromancers are custodians of balance between life and death they can raise powerful undead armies to fight for them while also wielding the powerful magics of bone shadow and blood so you're going to summon an army that consists of skeletal warriors skeletal mages and a golem the golem is going to be your big tanky character then your mages are going to be mages and the warriors are going to be melee characters then you've got your bone abilities use the power of bone magic to physically assail enemies bone skills often gain increased power when you have large amounts of essence so you've got an ability that it consumes all of your essence when you cast it and it increases in damage based on the amount of essence you spend. So when you spend it at full essence, it does 300% damage. Really, really powerful. Very fun ability. Then you've got darkness. Wear down enemies over time. Darkness skills utilize crowd control elements so that they are kept at bay while they die a slow, painful death. That's uh, basically crowd control abilities and dots. That's what you're gonna see in your darkness abilities. And then there's blood, siphon the life from your enemies with blood magic, which has a defensive benefit while also becoming more powerful as you increase your maximum life. These are abilities that are going to hurt the enemy and also heal you at the same time. So your blood abilities are gonna be great for keeping you topped off and while also hurting the enemy. Your darkness abilities are gonna be great for wearing your enemies down with dots and crowd control. Your bone abilities are gonna be great for your burst damage. This is really upfront burst damage. You don't have to wait for it to affect. It's just really heavy, hard hitting damage. And then your undead army is going to be, of course, a literal army of undead. Next, we've got the Sorcerer. The Sorcerer is the master of the elements, inflicts cold, fire, and lightning damage to subdue their enemies. You've got frost abilities, which chill your enemies and cause crowd control. You've got pyromance abilities, which are going to be burst damage up, very upfront damage. Boom, hits, does big damage, and then also can put burning dots on the enemy. Then you've got shock, which is going to use lightning abilities. You can do some interesting things with shock abilities to reduce cooldowns while critical striking your enemy. 
Next, you've got the Rogue. The Rogue uses whatever tools are available to get the job done, and that's a pretty accurate description. They've got a few abilities that are kind of all over the place. Rogues are both agile and resourceful and able to fight enemies at range with their bows or up close with their daggers. They are also able to imbue their weapons with various magics. The Rogue is a marksman. They kite enemies at a distance with bows and arrows. Marksmen benefit from critically striking enemies by causing them to become vulnerable. You've got your imbuements. Imbue your weapon with poison, cold, or shadow energies. These imbuements give attack special properties when they damage enemies these imbuements include poison which poisons your enemies cold which chills and slows your enemies and then shadow which infects your enemies with the shadow imbuement and when those enemies die they explode it's great for screen clearing so i really liked poison for single target fights and i really liked shadow for its massive aoe damage its ability to kill an entire screen full of enemies at the same time traps you lay traps on the ground, which can trigger various effects. Uh, there's a poison trap. There's also a deadly trap and the poison trap dots. Um, the deadly trap is just a massive AOE dot. They're both very powerful and very useful. Next, you've got the druid who's flexible and resilient. Druids harness the power of nature to protect life. Druids can shapeshift between a cunning werewolf and a bear. Additionally, they can also become a spellcaster or an elementalist to unleash earth and storm magic from a distance. If you lean werewolf, you're going to be way more agile. They benefit greatly from their attack speed and critically strong enemies so werewolf builds are going to be focusing on quick attacks lots of swipes lots of very fast movement the werebear is a more powerful on the battlefield dealing damage in large areas while being notoriously difficult to take down so your werebear builds are going to be more slow more methodical you're going to be waiting 12 seconds a lot for your pulverize to come off cooldown so that you can smash the ground but when you do you kill everything around you and it feels really good then you've got storm magic which is going to make you kind of like a lightning mage slash wind mage. And then you've got earth builds, which basically turns you into an earth bender. You can crush your enemy between rocks. You can throw boulders at them. Very fun, very cool abilities. The one thing they don't mention here, interestingly, is your companions, which are an important part of your build as a druid. The druid can choose to have two wolves, a creeping vine, or a flock of crows following him around at all times. Or he could choose to have all three out at the same time and benefit from their damage. Once they are slotted on your bar, you have them all the time. So you can be quite the little summoner as a druid if you want. That's just the brief overview of every class. And if you want to know anything else about any of these classes, be sure to check out my class guides linked down in the description below as soon as this video is over. So now that you've picked a class, let's go ahead and choose Necro here. You'll be able to pick a body type. We'll go with this one here and you've got a basically this is a starting template you get to customize from here so don't worry it's not like you're locked into one of these looks so we'll customize you've got some pretty basic selections to choose from here you can choose your skin tones your eye color you can choose a few different faces not massive in terms of character customization but massive for an arpg then we can go to hair we can choose different hairstyles make her look different Pick the hairstyle that's right for us. You can choose facial hair if you want, which on her is going to be eyebrows. Then you can choose hair colors. You can choose makeup and jewelry. And of course your body markings. So definitely remember to take advantage of those and you can change the colors of those. After you've designed your character and you've made it exactly the way that you want it to be and you're really excited about it, you've got the option to choose hardcore. And soon you'll have the option to make it a seasonal character as well. Hardcore characters die permanently. So if you make a hardcore character, <laughs> just know if it dies, it's dead forever. This is for experienced players. If you're brand new to Diablo, I wouldn't recommend jumping into hardcore. I'd play through the game first, learn the mechanics, get good at staying alive and not dying, most importantly. And then, you know, the thrill of hardcore can be a really fun challenge, but I wouldn't recommend starting with it. You don't get anything extra for playing in hardcore. So you're not missing out by not choosing it. When seasons become available, seasons will be very important. The first season won't start until about six weeks after the game launches. So that should be mid to late July. And if you're creating your character and you have the option to make a seasonal character, you'll want to do so. Seasons are going to have unique systems and mechanics and all kinds of really cool stuff for you to engage with. And so you definitely want to take advantage of seasons when they are available. And then finally, you're going to choose your name and then you can hit start game. Now, this is where you're going to be presented with the option to choose your difficulty that you start on. World Tier 1 Adventurer. So this is basically easy mode. It's for new players, for people who've never played an ARPG. You can go here to basically learn the ropes if you want. If you're the player, if you know yourself to be someone that enjoys 
being challenged a little more or at all, you're probably going to want to go for veteran. This is where I think the game is the best balance. I think this is going to be a little bit easy for most people, a little bit maybe too easy for most people. Whereas veteran, it's going to be a comfortable challenge, but it's still going to be quite easy if you're a veteran of the franchise, but you're going to get 20% increased experience and monsters are going to drop 15% more gold, which isn't massive on either front, but it's a nice little bonus for not much more difficulty. Then we're going to hit start. The first thing you're going to get is a cutscene. Diablo is going to have quite the story. We're going to skip this. Now, when you get into the game, you're going to see a UI that looks like this. So let's quickly go over what you're looking at here. The first thing is your health globe. If this gets to zero, you die. Pretty straightforward. This little symbol right here is your healing potion. If you hover over it, it tells you that it heals you for 17 life and then 35% of your health over three seconds. So it's got a burst heal and then a little heal over time attached to it. And you've got five charges, five out of five. So if you see a little red globe on the ground, that is a potion. If you walk over that red globe, it will pick it up. If you walk over it and it doesn't pick it up, it's because you have five out of five potions. These are what the potions look like when they're on the ground. This is two different potions. If I was at three charges, I could walk over both. It would automatically pick them up and take me back up to five. Your potion can be upgraded at the alchemist, and we'll go over that in the crafting section of this video. Very important to know, and a lot of people miss that. Next, you've got your level your character level. My character is level one because we just made this character for this video. And then you'll have your ability bar where you'll slot your abilities. And then this bar here above the skills is going to be your experience. It's going to tell you how close you are to leveling. This yellow bar will fill up as you kill more things. And when it's full, you level up. Over here, you see your evade. And when you press your evade button, you see that it shows you a timer. So it's got a five second cooldown on that ability. And there's items you get that will augment this. They'll make it so that you can evade twice in a row, or they'll make it so that when you evade, you move fast for a little while after. Very cool stuff attached to your evade. Diablo 4 is more vertical than previous ARPGs that we've played. It's got interactions to climb up and down ladders. Just hit the button that it tells you to for a PC. By default, it's going to be the space bar. Then you've got your resource bubble. In the Necromancer's case, this is called Essence. It, you know, every class has a unique name for it, but it always works the same. This is what you're spending to cast your big damage abilities. But next to that, you'll have this little yellow button here. This will notify you if you have unspent ability points. I do have unspent ability points at level one because of the renown system, which we'll talk about in a moment. You won't have unspent points at level one on your first character, but you will on your second character because of account wide progression systems in the game. We'll get more into that later. Don't worry. When this pops up, you'll be able to click this. Now you can see your skill tree for you as a brand new player. You won't really get into this until you hit level two and you get your first skill point and then you'll come in here to choose your basic attack. Your basic attack is your ability that is always available and doesn't require uh, any essence or any resource to cast. So I can use my basic attack anytime I want, and it's not going to cost any resources. So you're going to use your basic attack oftentimes as a debuff. It's going to debuff enemies. It's going to buff you. It's going to regenerate your resources sometimes, not always. Using your basic attacks doesn't always regenerate resources. On melee characters, it always regenerates resources. That's how they generate their resources. So the druid, the barbarian, the way they get resources is by using their basic attack. But for the rogue, the sorcerer and the necro, your resource is always filling up. For this video, we're going to go ahead and choose bone splinters. When you choose it, you'll see this line start to fill up. When it gets to here, you'll be able to choose one of these abilities. So you're working your way down the tree. Every time you put in a point into this section, this line will start going down farther and farther. So the next thing we're going to grab is our passive. You only get one option for your first passive for each ability. So it's a no brainer. You're just going to take it. Boom. You grab it. Now this is here, which means we've unlocked these abilities. And if we had more skill points, we could choose to unlock our next ability. Basically, the way that you're going to progress down this tree on almost every single build. Now, there are going to be exceptions to this, but this will be true 99% of the time. And what you're going to do is you're going to grab one basic attack and a passive. Then you're going to grab a core ability. And then what you're going to do is you're going to grab the passives attached to your core ability and your basic attack. And by doing that, it's going to fill this up so that you can unlock the next section. So generally speaking, I always unlock an ability first. So in this case, the basic ability. And then when I got to this section, I grabbed the blood lance. And then while I'm waiting to get to the next section, I grab the passives attached to the abilities. It's only two points per ability. And then when I get to the next section, I take the ability and then I'll start grabbing passives. If you get to a point where you've got your passives for your abilities that you want to use, but you're still not down to the next section, 
that's when you start grabbing these passives right here that are unattached to any skills. It's just a very nice passive. And in the case of the Necromancer, Hude Flush is an incredibly important one. This is one that helps create corpses even when there are no enemies dying. Very, very important to keeping minions up for the Necromancer. So this is almost a must. So then in that case, you would start putting points into this because you have no abilities that you want to unlock. You have no passives to abilities to unlock. So you start using these as kind of filler to help get you down the tree and continue that way and so on. But just because you get to a section and it has abilities, it doesn't mean you have to take an ability in that section. Abilities are totally optional. And sometimes you'll zip right by one of these sections and not take one of these abilities. And that is OK. If you read a description of an ability or if you try it and you don't like it, don't use it. And that brings us to the next point, which is if you try it and you don't like it, that's fine. You can respec out of it, which we'll cover in a moment here. Now, it tells you right here how many ability points you need to spend anywhere on this tree to get to this section and here it's 14 and here it's 21 and this is where your ultimates are located now we're going to talk about ultimates because there's something unique about them unlike every other section you can slot as many of these abilities on your bar as you want you could put both of these on the bar for the ultimate though you have to choose one and only one you cannot put two ultimates on your bar so you'll pick wisely the main thing about ultimates is they generally do a lot of damage and they have really long cooldowns so you can look at blood wave here it has a 50 second cooldown so that's almost one minute whereas other skills are going to have like 11 second cooldowns 12 second cooldowns cooldowns all the way up to like 24 seconds for a cooldown on a non ultimate ability generally a lot shorter and then ultimates are really long and then finally after your ultimate for every class there is a key passive you get to choose for every class and you only get to choose one of these just a heads up when you're planning your build now let's quickly talk about respecking respecking is really easy to do in this game it's a very fluid game you will get tons of gold making the respec costs fairly trivial and so right now i have a point into this bone splinters and i have a point into enhanced bone splinters let's say i put my points into that and i was like i hate this ability i hate this passive i hate everything about it so all you have to do is right click and it tells you the refund cost is zero. That's because you can refund abilities up to level five for free. So we'll do that. Normally, it would be a trivial amount of gold, say 40 gold to pull that point back out. Now you can see I have one point to spend. If I don't like this, I would take both out. Now I have two points to spend and then I could put it into something else. And I put it here and here. And that's how hard it is to respect. You just click on the thing you want to take the point out of and it comes out. The one caveat to this is that if you have a point here, that you were only able to get because you had points here. If you take this out, now this isn't unlocked anymore. So the game won't let you take a point out if you needed it to get to this location. So you would then have to take your points out of this ability and then this ability because the game won't let you have points in a section that you haven't spent enough points to have unlocked yet. So you might have to backtrack a little farther to get your points out of an earlier tree. You can do it one at a time, though. All that to say respecting is really easy. So don't stress about having the perfect build right away. A couple more cool things about your ability window. You can click this arrow to expand it. Now it's taking up the full screen. There you go. It still doesn't quite let you zoom out far enough, in my opinion, but it's a lot better. And then you can click this and this will let you search for certain things. Like if you want to search for a status effect, like maybe you're building a chill build and you want to chill things or maybe you're looking for the vulnerable debuff. You click that and now you can see it's highlighted this skill, this skill, this skill. These are interacting with vulnerable that are either allowing us to apply vulnerable to the enemy or increasing our damage to the vulnerable enemy. Things like that. So anything that plays with vulnerable. So if you're going to make a build that is built around something, this is really useful when putting your build together. What build am I making? You know, if you want to make your own build as opposed to following, what build am I making? Am I making one that's going to uh, specialize in conjuration? Am I making one that's going to specialize in cold? You know, what am I making? And then you can kind of pinpoint the abilities that are going to play well with that or that have to do with that. They're relevant to that that word. If you're enjoying this video, you'll love our website where we have detailed written guides for every single class, as well as beginner guides and more. Swing by d4.justlooted.com or hit the link in the description below. Now at the top here, we have another menu we can look into. We've got our character screen, our 
This is also our inventory, it's our profile, it's our materials storage, it's a lot of things on this page here, all very easy to see and glance at. So let's start at the top. First, we've got our profile. You click this and you can see your character nicely. When someone else inspects you, this is what they see. You can inspect other players in this game and they can inspect you. They can see what you're wearing, they can see your name, your title, whatever. They won't be able to see your battle net ID though, don't worry. And if you would like your information to remain more private, you can set it to private. Now you can edit this right here and you can select a title for your character. Like for instance, I can go with lucky and then I can go with goat. Okay, lucky ghost the lucky goat. There we go, confirm close and now my character has that title above her head you can also edit your emblem titles and emblems will be unlocked by playing the game so if you haven't played it yet you won't really have much if anything to choose from and then you'll see here emblem custom title lucky goat clan touch by Tyrion. you can see all those things about my character and if you will want to play the game without your friends harassing you you can click options you can drop this down and you can say that you're away, you're busy, or you can even appear offline so they don't know you're playing the game at all. The next tab on our character is materials and stats. Materials and stats. The first thing at the very top is going to be the tabs in this. It's very easy to miss, but you've got the one tab that is currency, core stats, offensive, and basically this is a wealth of information for you, which we'll go over. And then you've got this tab here, which is all of your crafting materials. No longer are these sitting in your inventory, taking up space cluttering up your storage chest. They have a tab for them and it holds them all here. It's amazing. It's beautiful. And if you're ever wondering how many you have of any item, you can come here and take a look. We've got 470 rawhide right now. Now back to the other tab. This is our stats tab. It's telling us all of our stats that we are tracking right now. Every stat you could want to know about your character is here, including your currency. So at the very top, you've got gold. It's your currency that you're going to use to respect your skill points and your paragon board. You're going to get a ton of gold and it's not very expensive to respec. This is meant to be a very fluid game, but you are going to want to spend it wisely. You're also going to use this gold when it comes to crafting, whether you're crafting gear, upgrading gear, re-rolling gear. There's a lot of ways to spend gold. We'll go over that in the crafting section, but gold is going to be very important for you. So definitely don't waste it, but you will get a lot of it. It's very easy to use on rerolling your character's stats, but you can easily burn through a lot of it when it comes to crafting. And next, you have murmuring obols used to purchase items from the purveyor of curiosities. So this is your gambling currency. You go to the purveyor, you gamble for gear. If you've played D3 and you gambled for gear in Diablo 3, it's exactly like that. It's just called obols now. You can get this from quests or events around Sanctuary. The important thing to know about obols is that there's a cap. Like for right now, my character can only hold 510 obols. If I get to 510, I can't pick them up anymore. I'm leaving them behind on the ground. So when you hit your cap, You'll walk over your obols and you'll see that it does not vacuum them up, which means you need to teleport to town and then go gamble for some piece of gear. I'll go much more in depth on the strategy of that when I get to the section of this video that's about all the merchants in the game. But just know that you have a cap. You need to spend them when you hit the cap or before or else you're just wasting them. And you can increase that cap with the renown system. So by doing completionist type activities, in the zones as you go through the game, you're going to unlock additional storage capacity for your obols. And I'll go over that when I go in the renown system. So you can increase this number 510. You can make that way bigger very easily. And we will. Next, you've got red dust used to purchase items from PVP vendors in the dry steps and Kajistan earned from altars of extraction by successfully purifying seeds of hatred. Seeds of hatred are only obtainable in PVP zones. This is a PVP currency that you farm in the PVP zones and then you spend it at merchants. If you're into PVP, this could be a fun thing for you to engage in. If you don't like PVP, then don't PVP. Sometimes when new players listen to me explain these guides, it can sound like I'm speaking a different language. Don't worry, it's gonna all click with time. Speaking of learning a different language, the sponsor of today's video is perfect for that. Babbel is an app that teaches you new languages by focusing on giving you the tools you need to have conversations in real world situations. By focusing on preparing you for conversations that you're most likely to have, you become conversational in your language of choice much faster. Since it's an app on your phone, you can learn at your own speed while commuting or while sitting at home or while playing your favorite game. It provides multiple ways to learn to keep you from getting bored. It's got lessons, games, videos, and content about culture. With just a 10 minute lesson a day, you could start having conversations in your 
your new language in as little as three weeks. In addition to learning the language, you'll learn about their culture, their people, and their history. If you've ever felt like it would be nice to know another language, use the link in the description down below to get 60% off. Check it out and start learning a new language today so that you can start having brand new conversations a month from now. Thanks for listening. Let's get back to the video. Next, you've got your level. Your level is going to increase when you kill things. Every level that you get until level 50 gives you a skill point after each quarter of a level gives you a paragon point. Damage dealt between you and an enemy are adjusted according to your level difference. So if you're way higher than an enemy, you're going to do more damage to them. If you're way lower than an enemy, you're going to do less damage to them. That is, there's this level scaling built into the game. So if you're level 20 and you're fighting something that's level 30, not only is it going to be stronger than you, but it's also going to be taking reduced damage from you. So if you came back to that mob that was level 30, in the same exact gear, right? All you had was 10 more levels and the same gear, you would do more damage because he had less damage reduction applied to you. This is to stop people from going to areas that they're not supposed to be in that are way higher level than them and killing things they're not supposed to kill you. Next, you have your stats, strength, intelligence, willpower, dexterity. What these stats do varies depending on what you are. A barbarian is gonna want strength, whereas a mage is going to want intelligence because this is going to increase their damage. A barbarian, intelligence isn't going to increase their damage, right? They're going to want something like strength. Dexterity for the rogue. So these descriptions would be a good thing to read when you get on your character, whatever your class is. Just kind of skim through them, know which stats you're looking for, know which stats do. Generally, in the early game, the stats that you get from gear are pretty negligible. It'll say it gives you 10 intelligence or 20 intelligence and you slap it on and these numbers will hardly move at all. It's not a stat you need to pay much attention to early. Certainly don't need to prioritize it early, but later when you're getting gear with very big numbers of intelligence, you know, high values of intelligence and stuff like that, that's when you'd start paying attention to that stat. But early on, don't worry about it. There's much more powerful stats like flat 10, 20% damage bonuses to enemies with certain conditions on them and stuff like that 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 are way better than getting a little extra intelligence and getting 0.2% more damage. Next, you have your offensive stats. Your weapon damage is primarily calculated by looking at the damage of your weapon. If you want to do more damage, the fastest way to do more damage is to have a better weapon, which is why when you first start the game, you generally just want to put on whatever weapon says it does more damage. So if you hover over a weapon and it see that damage per second there. And if that number is green, it's almost certainly better for you to wear early on. So just a little thing to note there. If you're hovering over a one hander, it's almost always going to be a lower value than a two hander. You've got to put both one handers on and then hover over the two hander to know if it's doing more damage. So early on that damage per second number, you can pretty much just look at it, you know, until like level 10, 15. And that's the thing you want to wear. If that's green, that's good. Now, later on, as you see with my gear here, you're going to start getting gear that has a lot of stats on it. Like there's some here that do 20% damage to distant enemies, 18% damage to core skill abilities. Those are massive buffs. So if this had a damage per second value that was slightly higher, that's so outweighed by these 20% increased damage to slowed enemies. So when I walk into a pack of enemies, the first thing I do is cast ice on them. So I'm getting 20% increased damage to slowed enemies, 18% damage to core skill damage. So that's almost 40% increased damage on top of my damage per second value on this weapon. All that to say, the stats down there become very important later on. That's where you start having to make strategical decisions. And that's where the damage per second stops being the end all be all for the decision. You have to start valuing the stats below it. And like I mentioned, the way that it calculates your weapon damage is it grabs the damage from a two-hander or it adds the value of two one-handers if you're wearing them. Your weapon speed is the attack speed of the weapon you're wearing. Two-handers are generally going to have slower attack speed than one-handers. Next, you've got your critical strike chance. When you deal damage, it has a chance to critically strike. By default, your skills deal 50% bonus damage when you crit. So. If you had a skill that was doing 100 damage and you crit, it's now going to do 150 damage or 150% of its value. Damage over time abilities cannot crit strike. You would not want to spec in crit chance and crit damage if you were a dot build, a damage over time build, because it doesn't work. Now, crit strike damage is the extra damage that is granted when you crit strike, and it has a base value of 50, which we kind of touched on there. Uh, you can increase both of these with gear and stats and all kinds of things. You put on gear, you put on certain stats, and your crit strike chance and your crit damage can go up, whereas overpower is slightly different. This is always going to be a 3% chance. You cannot increase your overpower chance. That's the first thing you should know about overpower. It's always 3%, except 
Some abilities have conditions where it goes to 100%, like the Druid is pulverized. If he only uses it once every 12 seconds, it counts up to 12 and boom, this changes to 100% overpower chance. And what happens when you overpower? Good question. When you cast a skill, it has a chance to overpower all of the damage on it. So right, everybody always has a 3% chance to overpower. By default, overpower does 50% increased damage, just like critical strike damage. But you can get gear that increases that. So my character has 72% overpower damage right now because I happen to have some gear that's increasing my overpower damage. But because it's only a 3% chance of happening, it's not really a stat I'm super concerned about. If I was doing a Druid build, I'd be all about it, but I'm not, so I don't really care because it's 3%, and I can't increase that 3%, so it's something that's almost never happening. Overpower damage is based on the sum of your current life and Fortify. Another reason this is really good for Druids, because the damage that Overpower is doing is based on your life pool. As a Sorcerer, I'm not really going for a lot of life. I, I do have a lot of shields, but you know, I'm a mage. If you're ever curious about when you're overpowering and when you're critically striking, if you see a white number over an enemy's head, that means you just did normal damage to them. If you see a yellow number over an enemy's head, that means you critically striked them. If you see a blue number over an enemy's head, that means you overpowered them. That means your overpower damage hit. And if you see an orange number over an enemy's head, that means you simultaneously critically strike them and overpowered them. It's very easy to tell when you overpower and when you crit and when you do both. Next, we have vulnerable damage. Vulnerable is a very powerful debuff in this game and one that's pretty easily accessible for most classes and one that most builds are gonna use because by default, vulnerable makes it so you do 20% increased damage to the enemies that have this debuff on them. You can get gear and things like that to increase this. Mine's at 26% increased damage. Maybe I had another two-handed weapon and it could say that it gives 20% increased damage to vulnerable enemies. So this number would then be 46% instead of 26%. So you can really stack up vulnerable damage quite easily. So it's a really powerful buff because not only does it by default make you do 20% increased damage, but you can get gear that greatly adds to that. What that looks like when you see it on an ability, for example, is if we look at Frost Nova on the Sorcerer here, and you look at this passive right here, Mystical Frost Nova. Frost Nova makes enemies vulnerable for four seconds, increased to six seconds against bosses. So this would be an example of a passive that you attach to an ability to take advantage of that vulnerable debuff. So you have all damage, increases all of your damage dealt. You have zero of this stat from items in Paragon, but I have a 6% bonus to my damage. I could get Paragon and items that increase it. Next, you have damage to crowd-controlled enemies. Increases damage dealt to crowd-controlled enemies. This includes those affected by slow, immobilize, stun, knockback, knockdown, taunt, fear, tether, daze, chill, freeze. So basically everything in the game that prohibits the enemy's movement in any way, shape, or form, whether it's slowing them, whether it's freezing them, whether it's taunting them. If you are controlling their movement or slowing their movement in any way, that falls into the crowd controlled category. So I'm getting 15.6% increased damage to those types of enemies. On top of that, I'm doing more damage for slowed enemies specifically. That's coming from this staff right here, 20.8% damage to slowed enemies versus distant enemies. So enemies that are far away. A distant enemy is just an enemy that is outside of melee range. So if you can't hit them with a melee attack, they are considered distant. If it says damage to close enemies, that is an enemy that you could hit with a melee attack. That's it. So a lot of times people see the distant thing and they think the enemy has to be really far away when really almost every enemy is distant because that just means they're outside of your melee range. Next, you have damage with fire. It's going to show up here. So if you have increased damage with fire, it's going to show up. If you have increased damage with cold, that'll show up. And it's pretty straightforward. It's telling you those skills will do that much more damage. Same thing with bleeding, burning. Poison, damage with shadow, damage with time, same thing. And then on top of that, you can get damage to specific types of abilities. These are core abilities. You hover over this little centerpiece right here and it says it's a core ability. You hover over this one here, it's a defensive ability. You hover over this one, it's conjuration. So you can get damage bonus to specific ability types as well. So there are multipliers for literally anything you can think of. Then there is thorns. Thorns is a type of damage that is reflected back at the enemy. If an enemy does direct damage to you, if you have thorns damage from gear or skills or whatever in your build, when they hit you, they're going to take that damage back, whatever that value is. The thing to know about thorns is it doesn't work from a damage over time ability. It has to be a direct attack, meaning 
a fireball hitting you. Boom, it hits, it hurts. That's a direct damage ability. Damage over time is something that hurts you over time, like maybe the burning effect from fire. But if they hit you with a sword, if they hit you with a fireball, you know, something direct, that's going to apply the thorns damage to them. Next, you have your maximum life. This is very clear. It's your health. If it gets to zero, you die. What happens if you die? Dying in Diablo 4 is usually a pretty minor affair, unless you're playing hardcore, at which point you've just deleted your character. Otherwise, it usually just means you've taken some durability loss on your armor. There are some situations where dying is much more punishing. Some dungeons, for example, will limit the number of deaths that you can have before you automatically fail. The easiest versions of these types of dungeons will let you die up to 12 times, while the harder ones will limit you to as few as 4. If you die in a Helltide, you will delete half of the cinders you've collected. In 99% of cases though, when you die, you'll just spawn at the last checkpoint with a little durability loss on your armor, which can be repaired at the blacksmith. It's also worth noting that if you're in a group, you can be revived by your allies. And next, you have your potion capacity. Mine is currently five because you can increase your potion capacity. You start with four, and then as you progress through the zones and you participate in the renown system, your potion capacity can be improved. Next, you've got all healing. So this is any buff you're going to take on healing. Life on kill. You can get items that add life on kill. When you kill something, you get extra life back. Life regeneration, this is just how much life comes in every second. Now we're gonna to touch on damage reduction real quick. Okay, that's this section here. Armor is going to reduce all damage taken, pretty much. It's going to reduce the incoming physical damage taken. This applies to both direct damage and bleeding over time. It's gonna to apply to non-physical damage taken, aka elemental damage. Most of your armor comes from your gear. Armor contribution, the inherent percentage that armor contributes to your base damage reduction against non-physical attacks. So 50% of your damage reduction to elemental damage is coming from your armor. The other half of your elemental damage reduction is coming from your your actual resistances. So it's very important to have resistances against the element that your enemy is dealing damage in because half of the damage that they do to you is calculated against these resistances while the other half is calculated against your armor. So having high armor helps with reducing all types of damage. Having fire resistance helps specifically reduce that fire damage. Half of the damage you take from fire is calculated based on your resistance. So you don't want to be slacking on these once you start getting into higher difficulties. Your resistances are going to become very, very important. Next, you have dodge chance, and that just means you have a chance to completely dodge damage that you would have taken. Then you've got things like damage reduction from close enemies. Like I said, that's anything close enough to hit with a melee attack. Then you've got damage reduction from distant enemies. That's anything that's too far to hit from a melee attack. We're almost done with this section of the video. Don't worry. Next, you've got your mana. You know what that is. That's your resource that you spend to fire off your abilities. This has a different name for every class, like the Necro is called Essence. The Barbarian is called Fury. Then you've got your regeneration of your resource. It tells you what that is. You've got your movement speed. You run at 108% movement speed. You you may have a maximum of 200% movement speed. So you can get up to 100% increased move speed on top of your starting 100% move speed. Anything beyond that is wasted. Lucky hit bonus. Lucky hit is probably the other thing that's going to confuse people the most outside of overpower. I think those are the two least intuitive things in Diablo 4's like stat system. But don't worry, it's actually really simple. It increases the chance of triggering lucky hit effects when your skills deal damage. Base lucky hit chance varies per skill. If you have multiple lucky hit effects, their probabilities roll independently. So what does that mean? You will have a skill and it will say that it has a 50% lucky hit chance. Next, PVP damage reduction. Inherent damage reduction granted against other players in PVP. We've got 92% stacks with all other damage reduction. Then we've got armor contribution. The inherent percentage that armor contributes to your base damage reduction against non-physical attacks in PVP. What you're seeing here is right now the way they balance the game. Armor is going to be more important for your damage reduction in PvP than it is in PvE. This is probably to help the melee characters survive against the mages. Now below materials and stats, you get a quick overview of what we just went over. Attack power, armor, life. Then your stats, it tells you where you're at. Quick overview on your stats. Now below that, you've got your equipment. All the equipment you're picking up. Every piece of gear, you'll notice a gem takes up the same amount of space as your boots. Uh, or a two-ended weapon. No more inventory Tetris. This is something I was happy to see go. I don't want to spend more time than I have to staring at my inventory. The less time I spend managing this, the happier I am. The more time I get to spend killing things. Next, you have consumables. These are elixirs and things that you can craft. You can see here, this one increases attack speed by 7% and experience by 5% for 30 minutes. 
it's worth noting that you could use these, you know, to help you level a little bit faster. There are some cheap ones that would allow you to basically have 5% XP bonus all the time, which is next to nothing. So don't sweat it. Don't feel like you need to maintain elixirs. You're, you know, it's not a big deal. Then you have your quest items. If you pick up an item for a quest, it's not going to sit in here and take up your inventory, your very valuable inventory space. No, it's going to sit in here in your quest items. And then finally, your aspects, which we will dive into. These are amazing, but just know they're going to be stored in here. And then finally, to the right, you've got sort. You can hit that button and it's going to put all the chest pieces next to each other, all the weapons next to each other, the boots. It's going to sort your inventory in a uh, perhaps easier to look for an item way below that you've got a quick view of your gold your red dust and your obols that is your character screen your inventory screen now on the top right of your screen you'll see that you've got kiobashad that's telling you what zone you're in right now we're in town you've got tab you can open up the map is what it's telling you the time and then below that you've got the mini map which is going to tell you what you're near in Diablo 4 we don't currently have a map overlay although I wouldn't be surprised if that changed at some point what we have instead is you get to open the map and you can right click on let's say you want to go to this dungeon and it's going to put this line there for your character to follow you have to manually follow it doesn't automatically do it or anything but that way you don't need like a full map you can just follow the line with your mini map and you will get to your destination below that you've got world tier we are in world tier 2 right now you can change this to world tier one and world tier two at any time by coming to this symbol on the map here. It's your world tier statue. Yes, you talk to it and it lets you change your world tier. We're going to dive deep into that in a moment. But first, before we do, let's talk about the map that we kind of had open there for a second and understanding what it's telling you. There is a lot of information to be found in this map because the open world is such a massive part of this game. First, let's go over the different quest types. If you see a gold marker, on the map, a gold exclamation point, that is a story quest. If you see a blue exclamation point, that is a side quest. If you hover over it, it'll tell you that the approximate level of that quest. If we accept this quest here, now it'll tell us where we're gonna go next. It'll put this little symbol on the map. That means we go into this area, right? It changed this dungeon blue, which is actually a cellar. And then it's got the little quest marker in there. And the third type of quest you'll run into early on is your class quest you can see here the different colors you've got yellow that's your story quest very important these are priority quests side quests which are the dark blue if you open up the map and you see a circle highlighting an area something is in that area sometimes it's exclamation point to pick up the quest sometimes it's a circle after you've picked it up that says go to this area if it's your main story quest it'll be light blue if it's a priority quest like a class quest which you should do the second you unlock it by the way and then finally you know side quests main story quests are very story related you can do one after the other. Generally speaking, if you want to, you can follow those story quests or you can deviate and do all of the open world activities in the game to greatly increase your character's power as you're going through the game, unlocking some really, really cool stuff. Don't worry. If you're wondering what all of the important steps are for your leveling process, I've got you covered. Be sure to check out my complete leveling guide linked down in the description below so that you can make sure you don't miss anything important on your way to max level. You know, your priority quest, that's going to be for like crafting, uh, whether it's upgrading your potions, upgrading gems, crafting gear, upgrading gear, that kind of stuff. And then side quests are going to be little side quests with a little bit of a story attached to them and maybe a nice little reward some crafting materials or something like that. Other things to be aware of on the map are going to be your waypoints. That's these bright blue ones here. These are your waypoints. Definitely grab them anytime you see yourself walk up to one. This is what they will look like when you see them out in the wild. These three little fires, that means you've activated it. So until you walk up and touch it, it will be inactive and you won't be able to teleport to it. So make sure whenever you see these, go touch it, unlock it, and you're good to go. Next thing we can see on the map is dungeons. These are dungeons. They are located all over the map. In fact, there are over 100 dungeons in the game and 23 in the Act 1 area alone. So if we zoom out as far as we can, you can see this map goes all over the place. You can hover over zones to see approximately when you should expect to be able to go there. Like this zone is 20 plus. This zone's 35. You can see that at the top there. This zone over here is level 40. So it's all over the place with these levels that you should be before going to those areas. At the very top here, you can see it's giving us an outline of all the things in the zone that we're in right now. We're in the Fractured Peaks area, which kind of feels like Act 1 of a Diablo game, if you've played previous entries. And it's telling me that there's seven waypoints, of which I've got. 
There are three strongholds, 35 side quests. I've only done 13 of those so far. There's 76 points of interest. So like if you go through an area and you discover it, see how this is kind of, there's fog of war right here. If I walk over there, we'll discover that and we'll light that up. There are 23 dungeons and 28 statues of Lilith. You want to grab these anytime you see them. When you grab statues of Lilith, it's going to give you permanent boost to your entire account. These are account wide buffs, each and every one. It's account wide progression. When you grab these, they're going to give you things like two intelligence, which one at a time is very insignificant amount of intelligence to be added to your character. But by the time you've collected every statue of Lilith, that will be a significant boost in power, especially when you make maybe your second character or your third character. They're going to be starting with quite the upper hand because they're going to have passive stats collected from all of those statues of Lilith, sometimes giving strength, intelligence, willpower, or dexterity, tons of those things. And then also you're going to get extra skill points from your renown, which we'll go over next. This is the altar of Lilith. Now, when you click on the altar of Lilith, you're going to get a permanent account wide buff and you're going to unlock some renown. So we'll click on this one here and it says willpower has been increased by two for all characters within this realm. There you go. Now that we've unlocked it, it's going to show up on the map. So you can see we unlocked a few here. These are your strongholds. Definitely pay attention to strongholds. They're one of the harder things to unlock, but they're also very valuable to unlock for a couple of reasons. Another important thing to note about the map over here, Ashava spawns. This is where Ashava, the, the first world boss you'll encounter will spawn. Uh, it drops really good loot here. Right now, Ashava has been dropping one to two legendaries per kill, which is pretty huge with the drop rates as they are. Uh, Ashava is one of the best sources of legendaries. And then the Butcher was another great source of legendaries every time i killed the butcher i got one legendary and every time i killed the shava i got one or two definitely try to show up to those shava spawns when they happen and definitely when you find the butcher in one of these dungeons another thing you'll see on the map are cellars you can go into these cellars and inside these cellars there's a good chance there will be an event where you can get some loot some obols and at the very least there will be a boss for you to kill and a cellar to clear cellars do not have aspects like the dungeons do. There will be some parts of the map that you'll have to go complete an event. And when you do, it'll unlock a way shrine and maybe some quests. So if you're ever in a part of the map and you feel like you're a long way from a way shrine, you know, take a look around, maybe finish the event that's nearby and it might just spawn a town and unlock a way shrine for you. When you're on the map, if you press F on PC, it brings up this menu right here. The button's listed right here, whatever it is on your platform. And you can filter things on or off if you know you're getting too much clutter as you unlock stuff in this game and there will be quite a few things on your map so if you open up your map and look for a dungeon with the little box next to it like this one has right here that means there is an aspect in there that you have not collected yet it's very important to know about that if you hover over it, it's going to tell you which aspect it is. Direct damage against bleeding enemies has a 20% chance to stun them for two seconds. And it also tells you that it's for barbarians only. Some aspects are going to be for all classes. Some are going to be for specific classes. And it lets you know up front so that you know whether it's one you want to go hunt out right away or maybe leave for later or maybe never grab it all. Now, when you're looking at the map and only when you're looking at the world map, not a dungeon map, but when you're out in the open world, and you're looking at the map here, you can press W to pull up the renown system. This is a very important system. This is account wide progress, much like your statues of Lilith. They're a part of this. So as you can see here, the first reward was 3000 gold and one extra skill point. So it gives you a skill point, not only for the character that you are on when you earn it, but also for every character you create thereafter. So when you make a brand new character, he's going to start with a free skill point just waiting to be spent even before you hit level two. Next thing you unlock is you get 10,000 gold and a potion capacity. So you start with four potions that you can use and you get this and now you have five potions. Very, very useful. And then the next one was 25,000 gold and another skill point. So you can see this is very, very useful. How do you get renown? How do you progress and unlock these stages? So this is how you'll increase your obol capacity. You also get a ton of gold and you get four paragon points here. So this is also going to get paragon points. So this is going to be a very, very powerful form of progression. Now, how do you get this? It tells you right down here below. Renown value for each waypoint is 20. So if you collect a waypoint, you get 20 and there would be a bar filling underneath this if I hadn't already filled it. So let's say I was 50. There's like a yellow bar. It looks like an XP bar and it fills up a little bit until you unlock it and then claim it and it looks like this and so the fastest way to move that bar and why i was telling you to remember those strongholds is because it's a hundred points for each stronghold so if you go to a stronghold you get a massive chunk of one of those bars 100 points for each stronghold side quests give you 20 each areas discovered gives you five each area you remove the fog of war on you're gonna get five renown 
just for exploring. It's a little, but adds up. Side dungeons, each one you complete is going to give you 30 renown. So you go in, you kill everything or you kill the boss, whatever it wants you to do in that dungeon. It may vary. Sometimes it's a boss. Sometimes it's killing three totems. Depends. And that gives you 30 each. And then altars of Lilith. You got to find them and interact with them, which just collects them. And it gives you 10 renown each. And also those passive skill points that I touched on earlier. Very important. So that is how the renown system works. It's basically a completionist type of activity that has account wide progress attached to it. So when you get these upgrades, they apply to all of your characters, not just the one you're playing on. Very, very nice. Right below these, it's telling you that this symbol means that this is claimed by each character. So each character is going to get 3000 gold. Each character is going to get 10,000 gold. Each character is going to get that reward. This is telling you that it unlocks all characters on that realm. So every character is going to get these skill points. Every character is going to get this potion capacity upgrade. And then over here, we've got the little three lines. That means that that's not going to be unlocked until world tier three. So we are as far as we can go until we get to 50 and we do our capstone dungeon. Another thing that you can see from this menu is, as it tells you your hotkey right here, it says collections, Y, whatever that's going to say for console. You can open this up and you've got your collections. This has your challenges, which this is your achievements. You come in here and you can see the achievements that you have earned so far. Pretty straightforward. And then on the other side, you've got your Codex of Power, which we'll dive into when we get to that section. I have a whole section of this video dedicated to aspects and Codex of Power. Then you have Social, which is where you will accept friend requests, send friend requests, see your friends and what they're up to, what character they're on and all that good stuff. You can add friends simply by opening this up. The hotkey on PC is O. And then you click add friend. You just type in their email address or their battle tag right here, and it will send the request to them and add them as a friend. Then we have clan in this menu where you can manage the clan. You can set it to private to public so people can find you in search results. You can put information, description, message of the day, whatever you can have your language. You can put what categories of content you're your clan is into. You can leave the clan. You can disband the clan. You can join a voice chat and voice chat with your clan. If you'd rather do that, then use like, say, Discord. You can see who's online. You can manage your join requests if you're one of the leaders. Go here, click accept. One thing to note is for some reason, after someone requests an invite and you accept it, they have to accept that you accepted their request. It's a really weird system. I don't know why it's that way. It just is. And then down below, you can see the news feed. It's going to tell you like what achievements and stuff, what, what your clan's up to, what they've done, what they've accomplished. Clans are nice to be in, especially in this game, because there's a lot of like group oriented activities that you could do. You could do dungeons together. You could do the overworld content together. You could even group up to go kill a Shava together so that you know you have at least four people that are ready to go kill that world boss. To group up with other players, all you have to do is open your friends list and then click on their name and then you get a lot of options. You can view their profile, whisper them, invite them to party, request to join their party, invite them to your clan, add to favorites, remove friend, block player, set note, right? You can also do it with your wheel. By default, your wheel is bound to E if you're on PC and you just hold that letter down. Mine is G because I changed it and you click invite the party. This wheel is also where you're going to be able to use your emotes and things like that. This is actually useful information for these little shrines out in the world. These are the shrines that you'll find out in the wild. And when you click on them, you'll see a string of text, but one of the pieces of text will be in capital letters. This is what you want to pay attention to. It says bid farewell. What action do we have that is kind of like bidding farewell? Probably buy. So we click that goodbye and it says ignite the depths of the soul. Your movement speed is temporarily increased. So it's like a little mini puzzle. It's not much of a puzzle at all, but it's like a little thing you can do. And now my character has move speed increased by 10% for this duration here. So it's just like a quick little thing you can do with your interact wheel to get a little tiny buff or, you know, kind of proc some kind of thing. If you want to add more stuff to your mouse wheel, all you can do is hit customize and then you come in here and you can drag. You just click, put it there. Boom. Yes, right, that's there. You can also come in and put consumables on your wheel if you don't wanna to have to open up your menu to use consumables, which most likely you won't want to do. You can come in and miscellaneous, you can add leave dungeon, open chat, mark for blood or zoom. So if you wanna mark a target and stuff like that. And then finally social, you can put invite to trade, invite to party, which we already have. You can put inspect, player menu. A lot of these are already there by default. So that's how you use your quick wheel. So if we look at the map, you can see these uh, symbols. Each one's very important. You've got world tier statue, wardrobe, stash. You've got rings and amulets. You've got the occultist, your stable master, your alchemist, your healer, and 
your purveyor of curiosity. So let's go over what each of these things does. So your wardrobe, you come up to your wardrobe. This is where you can change your appearance is very powerful and very, very, very well made. Um, you click on an item and then you can see it on your character. There you go. And so we could do that. We could change our gear or changing our chest. Now um, this one has a cape. This one doesn't looks great. Then we've got gloves and so on. You can change these things. The way you get extra things in here is by salvaging at the blacksmith, which we'll go over in a moment. So the blacksmith, you walk up to it, you salvage your items. And when you salvage items, some of them will become eligible for transmogging here at the wardrobe. You can get extra wardrobe slots like here. I can save my look. And then if I want, I can buy another one or just slot. Okay. And now I can have a second loadout with a different look if I wanted to. Let's say I wanted to do, you know, this instead, right? I could save this look if I wanted to. And then items is actually where your weapons are. Uh, so you can come here and you can change your weapons. You get some really cool stuff unlocked early. We're only level 20 in this video and we've already unlocked a, a lot of really cool looks. Changing your look is free. The only thing that costs money is buying extra ensemble slots. In order to change the color of the gear you're wearing, you have to click on a piece of gear that you have transmogged. So you put this one on and then you can click this and it'll change it to that color pattern. It's a dye pattern. You don't get to choose the colors one at a time. It's got a really handy feature where if you hold down the button, it applies it to all of your gear, that color pattern so that they all match rather than having to go to each piece of gear and do it one at a time. You can just hold the button down and it does it all. The important thing to know about this, if you're wearing a piece of gear and you have not transmogged the look of that gear, you can't change the color of it. You can only change the color of transmogged gear. So sometimes you get stuck in a situation where you're wearing something that looks really cool, but it also has really good stats. So you can't salvage it, which means since you haven't salvaged it, you can't put it in your transmog system. If that happens, you'll have to wait until you find an upgrade for that item before you can salvage it, which would then add it to this list. It would unlock it right here. It would be there, but that's your outfit. Isn't the only thing you can change here at the top. You'll also see another tab appearance where you can change your character's makeup. Some of the options you had in the character creation screen, let's say you made your character and you kind of regret some of the choices you made. It's not looking so hot as you thought it did on day one. Don't worry. You can come in here and change your makeup and your jewelry and your body markings. Uh, you won't be able to change all of the features, but you can change some of them in here. Pretty nice. One more thing about your transmog is that there's a little icon over the gear. If you see that, it means you can hide transmog. You hover over it. It tells you that right here. You click it and it's going to hide that transmog. So it's going to look like it's default form. In this case looks pretty fantastic there. I think it's even better than what I'm wearing. But in order to have that as a cosmetic, I would have to destroy the item. And I didn't want to do that. Next, we'll go over the stash and how that works. You've got a stash. This is account wide storage. This you can access on any character that you create. It's also extra storage for any character you create because we have a very limited inventory. We don't want to store everything here. We want to put stuff in the stash. This is account wide. You can buy extra tabs by clicking this little button here, buy an extra one for 100,000 gold. So you can increase the size of your stash tab. You can edit the tab. You can give it a little symbol to indicate what kind of items you're storing in that tab because you will have a lot of tabs in the end. You can sort your tab by clicking this button and it will sort them in some kind of like order that makes sense to put all your legendaries together. For example, all your gems together, that kind of thing. One important thing to note about the stash tab for hardcore players is that you can store things in here that you don't want to lose when you die because a hardcore character loses everything on this screen right here. Everything on your character and in your inventory on your character is going to be gone when that character dies. However, if you store all those extra goodies, put all those good items that you were holding on to, you keep them in your stash tab. If you die, you get to keep these and then wear them on the next hardcore character you create. So take advantage of that. Now, speaking of salvaging items to add it to your wardrobe, we've got the blacksmith here. You interact with the blacksmith and he's got three different tabs for you. The first one is salvage. When you're at the blacksmith salvage window and you see a pickaxe icon, just like this one right here, that means that when you salvage that item, you're going to get that transmog unlocked for your character. If you see that on an item, when you salvage it, it adds that appearance to your character's collection of appearances at the wardrobe that you can use. And that's exactly how you're going to unlock all of your transmogs for your characters. In addition to unlocking cosmetic options for your character, it also gives you crafting materials that you'll use in the other tabs of this thing right here. 
serum. You can destroy all junk or all commons, or you can click this and it'll salvage the blues. The rare will salvage the yellow. Below, it shows you exactly what you got for salvaging it. And I got all those items for salvaging it. And those we're gonna use for all kinds of crafting in this game. The next tab is going to be the repair tab. Definitely don't forget to repair your gear. It's very easy to be fighting a Shaba, die, and then realize all your gear is broken. When you die in Diablo, your gear takes durability damage. If we look at a piece of gear here, it says down at the bottom, durability is 100 of 100 because I just repaired it. Uh, if I had died, it would have taken some durability damage all the way until it breaks. Each death hurts it a little bit. So that's what repairing is for, if you've never done that in a game before. And then we've got upgrade your weapons and armor. So you can put items in here, like if I put this rare gloves in here i can upgrade it for a measly 480 gold and 10 of my rawhide i have 477 so upgrading a rare is pretty cheap now i've upgraded it once now it's going to take 10 rawhide and some superior leather and then again it would take some failed crystals and each time i upgrade it it's adding five item power to the item which is basically increasing the stats on the item so early items have a thing called item power as you're leveling up in the game Generally speaking, the higher the item power, the higher the stats can roll on that item. So by increasing the item power, we are increasing the stats. So right now it says 4.2% chance to critical strike. If we upgrade this, now it says 4.5% chance to critical strike, right? So all the stats on this got just a little bit better, except for plus one to rank fireball. That doesn't go up every time we upgrade it, unfortunately. So now it's got plus 15 towards item power. Its armor values and adjustable stat values have been adjusted. So if we try to upgrade these legendary boots, same materials, same thing. Weapons are gonna be taking different materials and be quite a bit more expensive expensive, especially if it's a two-hander. Everything for two-handers is multiplied by two, pretty much. You're getting two instead of one, so it's everything's costing twice as much. If we preview what happens if we upgrade it, it shows you here what's going to happen when you upgrade it. The damage is going to go up by six. Uh, each of the other things is going to go up by like one to two percent. So it's going to be a nice little boost in damage for this item if we were to do this. We are currently missing uh, Baleful Fragment, rare crafting material salvaged from and used to improve legendary weapons. So you've got to salvage legendaries in order to get that final upgrade on legendaries. I was able to do a few of them without salvaging, but this final upgrade would require me to salvage a legendary item. So that's the blacksmith. You can salvage items to get materials and to add items to your wardrobe. You can repair items to prevent them from breaking and you can upgrade items to marginally increase their power. Next, you've got the healer. Talk to him. He heals you. That's it. Pretty simple. The, the town also has merchants where you can buy things from. Sometimes you might see the little symbol that says you can add it to your cosmetic collections by by salvaging it. So when you see that symbol on one that you could buy, it might be something that you want to buy, perhaps. But at 72,000 gold, these things are not cheap by any means. That's a lot of gold. That's almost half of my gold for what is not a great item. So I definitely would not buy these things. And it tells you that you'll get a new stock in delivery in six minutes. So it tells you when that's going to refresh. Over here, we have the jeweler. You'll get a quest that tells you to come over here and the jeweler will tell you about crafting. And basically the way this works is you can craft gems, you can unsocket gems, you can add sockets to gear, and you can upgrade jewelry all here at the jeweler. The jeweler is very, very useful. So in order to craft gems, you would just click on the gem you want to craft, and then it's going to combine three of them to make a slightly better gem. So right now we have a crude diamond, right, which does 7% ultimate skill damage. If we come in here and we upgrade our crude diamond, it's going to do 9% ultimate skill damage. And you'll be able to upgrade this multiple, multiple times throughout the course of the game. All you do is click on it, click craft, and now you have a chipped diamond instead of a crude diamond. All of the stats went up making it more useful, then you can take this item and you can slot it into gear. And depending on what piece of gear you slot it into, it's going to have a different effect. Weapons will give you ultimate skill damage. Armor will give you barrier generation. Jewelry will give you resist all elements. So depending on what you need, you're going to put different gems in different things. And just in case you're curious about what each one does, uh, you've got your amethyst, which adds to damage over time on weapons. It adds to damage taken over time, reduction on armor, and it adds shadow resistance on your jewelry. Emeralds add critical strike damage to vulnerable enemies. That's going to be very powerful. It adds a thorns if you put it in your armor. Great for your thorns builds. It adds poison resistance in your jewelry. Ruby 
is going to add 15% overpower damage. Great if you're like a druid with an overpowered pulverized build. It adds 2.5% max life to your armor. It's increasing your life by a percent value when put into your armor. That is incredibly powerful. Jewelry is going to give you 14% fire resistance. You're seeing here the color correlates to the resistance element. Emerald was poison resistance, ruby fire resistance, amethyst was shadow resistance. Topaz is going to be lightning resistance when you put it in your jewelry. When you put it in your weapon, it's going to give you basic skill damage. And when you put it in your armor, it's going to give you damage reduction while control impaired. So if you get stunned, slowed, whatever, you're going to take 7% less damage. Next, we've got the Sapphire, which is going to give you critical strike damage to crowd controlled enemies, which on some builds is all enemies because you're always either slowing them, snaring them, freezing them, chilling them, some kind of crowd control. You would have an additional 7.5% critical strike damage to all of those enemies. Then in your armor, it adds damage reduction while fortified and on your jewelry, cold resistance. For diamonds in the weapon, it's going to give you ultimate skill damage. It's going to give you 3.5 barrier generation in your armor and in your jewelry, it's going to give you all resistances. Very handy. Now, last but not least, the skull, it's going to give you five life on kill if you put it in your weapon. Now that number is going to go up. All these numbers are going to go up drastically as you upgrade these gems, something to keep in mind. So if the values look low now, just imagine when you've upgraded it three or four times. So five life on kill when put in your weapon, 3.5% healing received in your armor, and then 125 armor when put into your jewelry. That is what the gems are, what they do, and how you use them, and how they're crafted and upgraded. So you'll find these all over the world. Like at low level, you'll find crude skulls, and then you can upgrade those crude skulls into chipped skulls. And then when you get higher level, mobs will start dropping higher level gems as well. They'll drop chipped eventually instead of crude and so on. Now let's talk about unsocketing. So if we were to put this crude skull into this jewelry and then we're like, oh man, I want to upgrade it. I have a better skull. I don't want that in there anymore. Then we could come here. We could unsocket it and just Take it right out. And now there it is, right out of the item. The jewelry is intact. So use your gems liberally. Put them in your gear. When you find a gem, if you have an empty socket slot, don't be shy. Don't be afraid to use it. Go ahead and slam that sucker in there. It is free. And once it's out, you can upgrade it or whatever you need to do with it while it's out. Add it to your collection and put something better in. Next, we've got add sockets. So if you've got a piece of gear and it doesn't have a socket, but you would like it to because maybe you want to put a diamond in to get all resistances, you can add a socket. It's going to cost one scattered prism, a mysterious prism, most often found very, very large bodies such as world bosses. OK, so I've killed a a few times. That's why I have this. And then a few other things. I killed the butcher. Maybe he dropped one. I've got some of these. And it's going to cost 11,000 gold. So that's going to cost you a pretty valuable resource here and some gold. So, you know, you may not want to add sockets to everything, especially early on when you have a limited number of these resources. But certainly once you start finding like maybe you find a really good piece of gear, you can go ahead and add a socket to it. Next, we have upgrade jewelry. So just like you could upgrade your weapon at the blacksmith or your armor at the jeweler, you can come here and upgrade your jewelry. So we can put this here and it says that it's going to cost us five iron chunks. Iron chunks can be found in the world. You'll see a rock that you can mine and you interact with it and it gives you iron chunks. Pretty simple. And then you click upgrade and it upgrades it. And once again, the more you upgrade it, the more materials it's going to cost you to hit upgrade again. Veiled crystals you find by salvaging rare items. So when you salvage blue gear and when you salvage rare gear, right, you're getting materials that you're going to use to upgrade. And the color is kind of corresponding. It makes it easy to keep track of. Boom. Now we did that. It is fully upgraded. And each time we upgraded it, the stats on it got a little bit better. So that is everything that you can do at the jeweler. Next to the jeweler is a merchant where you can buy items. You can check these shops once in a while. Once again, incredibly expensive for what they are, especially, you know, a blue ring, 35 grand, not worth it. And again, it tells you when it's going to refresh. All right, if you've made it this far into the video, hopefully that means you're enjoying the video. If that's the case, you're going to love my second YouTube channel. It's linked down in the description below. It's 100% Diablo, 100% of the time. Be sure to check that out. All right, let's get back to this video. All right, next up we have the occultist. The occultist is incredibly important. Perhaps the most important crafter in the entire game. This is where you can turn rares into legendaries. You can add a legendary aspects to gear. Don't worry if you don't know what an aspect is. Let me explain. When you hover over a piece of legendary gear, you see the orange text at the bottom. That's the aspect. That's the legendary aspect of this gear. You take 22% less damage from crowd controlled or vulnerable enemies. So if we go here and we put this necklace here, I want to add an aspect to it. I could click on my codex of power 
and I can choose one of these that are in here. For instance, damaging an elite enemy grants you a barrier absorbing up to 240 damage for 10 seconds. This is one of the most powerful aspects in the game, especially early on, especially for hardcore characters. This is an important one to have somewhere on your character because this gives you a massive shield that every time you run into an elite, which is exactly when you would need it. And it can reapply that shield every 10 seconds. So it's up all the time. So I click that. Now it's turning that rare amulet into a legendary amulet with that aspect on it. And it kept all the rare stats. So you find a good rare and then you can turn it into a legendary with that aspect. It's a really, really cool system. It makes rares really valuable. Basically, you can put that legendary set on any good rare you find. Really powerful system. Now, you might be wondering, how do you get these aspects? Okay, if you don't know how you get aspects, what you do is you see these dungeons on the map. Each one of these dungeons has an aspect attached to it. And if there's a little yellow chest in the bottom right corner of this little image here, I'll show one on screen. This is what it looks like. There isn't one because I've collected all of these. Uh, but if you see that little yellow chest next to it, that means there's an aspect there and you hover over the dungeon and it tells you what aspect it will give you. So this one here, Lost Archives, around level 15 or so, head back to this area, run this dungeon, and that is gonna give you this one right here. That gives you that barrier that absorbs all that damage every time you're fighting an elite. And it's a really good one to have. So every dungeon has its own aspect attached to it. You can hover over the dungeon to see which aspect it has to see if that's one that you want to run. And it'll tell you if it's sorcerer only, druid only, necro only. So if it's for a class that you're not playing, you can just avoid it altogether if you want. Or you can go grab it because these are account wide. So once you grab it on one character, all your characters will be able to use it. Your codex is account wide. Why? So one important thing to note about the Codex of Power is it tells you what each section is. You've got your defensive aspects, which can be on any of these pieces of gear, shield, helmet, chest, pants, amulet. You can put that on any of those. You've got your offensive ones, which can go on your amulet, your weapon, your gloves, your ring. You've got your resource aspects, which can go on your rings only. And then you've got your utility, which can go on your shield, your helmet, your chest, your amulet, your gloves, your boots, and then your mobility ones, which can go on your amulets and your boots. There's a very handy checkbox right here that says show for my class only. You can see one disappeared because while it shows me that I have this collected, this character couldn't use it. So I don't want to really see it when I'm browsing for like which ones I want to put on my character. You can see quite a few are not relevant to the sorcerer. And that's because every time you complete a dungeon, you get an aspect added to your codex that may or may not be relevant for your character. Now that is your codex of power. And that is how your codex of power works. Another way to access your codex of power is to open it in your collections, codex of power, and you can see all of them listed here. You can see all defensive, offensive, resource, utility, and mobility. You can see all of them. And then you can do this, and then that way it limits it to the ones that you have access to. And you can hover over them and see what they do. Very, very powerful system, that Codex of Power. And remember, it's always rolling the lowest value. So that means they're great to use temporarily and early on. So like starting a fresh character that doesn't have legendaries that are going to really make the build shine yet. You can slap some aspects onto it from your Codex of Power and get that new character going. Or to get your first character going, you don't have a lot of great gear yet. You need them to have some power. Come in here, turn a few rares into legendaries with some cool powers on them, and you're good to go. Now, there's the other side of this aspect from inventory. How do you get this? The way you get aspects from your inventory is you have to come over to the next tab, and it says extract aspect. We put the item in there, and it's going to destroy that item, and it's going to give us this orange text. The aspect, the powerful part of the legendary that makes it a legendary, is going to just be reduced to a crafting item. We're going to get that. Your cast of charge bolts have a 17% chance to be attracted to enemies and last 300% longer. Now, I chose this item because it shows something really, really important about aspects, and that is when you apply an aspect to a two-handed weapon, its power is increased by 100%. So that aspect is doing double its effectiveness if it's in a two-handed weapon. If it was in an amulet, it would be 50% increased powerful. So if you have a really, really important aspect for your build, putting it in a two-handed weapon is a really good idea. And the next best would be putting it into an amulet right? because it's going to double its power. As you can see, it says your cast of charge bolts have a 17% chance of being attracted to enemies. But if I put it in a two-hander, it's 34% chance. So double. Very, very useful to know that. Something to keep in mind when you get a good aspect and you're trying to decide what piece of gear to put it on. Your two-handed weapon is always a good choice if it's something really powerful, really that's going to double really well uh, and be good for your build. Just remember that, you know, 
there are limitations. Some of these can only go in certain things. Not everything can go into a weapon. So you might want to double something and then you realize, oh man, it doesn't go into weapons. So just make sure you check on that first. So let's try this out. We're going to take these pants. We're going to extract it. It's going to cost us 11,000 gold. That's a good chunk of gold, but it's not a massive chunk of gold. So don't be afraid to do this. Uh, extracting this item's aspect will destroy the item. Are you sure you want to proceed? Yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. Okay, so now a lot of people are like, holy crap, where'd it go? Well, it went to your aspects tab right here. It's right there. Don't worry, you didn't lose it. So now what you could do is you could put your pants in, either a rare pants or you can overwrite an existing legendary. Maybe you got a legendary with really good stats, but you don't like the legendary aspect on it. It's not good for your build. So you can put the legendary in there and then you can put the aspect, right? And overwrite the legendary or it could be a rare. That's fine too. And it's going to tell you, okay, now you're going to get that item that you had before, but now it's going to have the new aspect on it, the 22% one. And because I didn't grab it from the Codex of Power, it's 22% instead of 20%. It grabbed the percentage from the legendary that I destroyed to grab the aspect. It could have been the minimum, but it wasn't. So let's go ahead and put that aspect into these pants because there's something else to know about this, okay? Except. All right, now my pants have that aspect. I've put it in there. I've got that aspect in these pants. And you're like, sweet, what happens if you find another pair of pants that are better than these pants? And you want to put this aspect into the new pants. So you would come here. Uh-oh, you can't do that. You cannot extract an aspect from a imprinted aspect or one that you made. So since we put this aspect into this piece of gear, we cannot take it out again. So you can't recycle endlessly an aspect. So if you want to upgrade your pants, you've got to find this aspect again, or you've got to grab it from your Codex of Power to put it onto the new pants. So when you find a really good high value aspect out in the wild, you have to kind of be conscious of what you stick it into, like what item you come apply it to, because you won't be able to get it off of that item. It's done forever after that point, uh, which is why when you find spare legendaries like let's say you find an aspect that you're already using and you already have and you don't need it stick that bad boy in your stash that we talked about earlier that way if you find a better rare you can put the aspect on it again it's always good to have extra backups of aspects that are good for your current build or your next build or the new classes build that you're going to make someday down the road i would say hoard those legendaries unless they just are something you know you'll never use or maybe they have a cosmetic attached to them that you want to unlock uh, the next section of this is sigils you can craft sigils these are keys that are going to let you go into dungeons down the road so you can salvage sigils to break down the components so that you can craft sigils so that you have better keys uh, for the dungeons that you want to run for the rewards you're trying to unlock this is kind of an end game this is post 50 world tier 3 free content right here so you don't need to worry about this early on and i'll have a dedicated guide to all of this for when you get there okay and next we have enchant item this is going to be very familiar to people that play diablo 3 you can re-roll one stat on an item let's say i have my gloves here and i have these gloves and i really like that these gloves have plus one fireball because that's my main damage ability i like crit chance because that's always good to have because i'm not running a dot build you would not want crit chance if you were running a dot build because dots can't crit but I'm not running a dot build, but it has that 18 willpower, which is just really underwhelming to me right now. It's not something I want. So I can re-roll that stat. It's going to cost me one out of my 81 veiled crystals, and it's going to cost me 5,000 gold. Not bad, really inexpensive for this first roll, but the price goes up really fast. So remember that it was 5,000 gold and one veiled crystal. All right, I can get plus one to rank of incinerate. So plus one to a whole new ability, which would be great if I was using that ability, but I'm not. Or 1.8% attack speed. That's good. I'll take that. Okay. So now this item has that 1.8% attack speed instead. Now look at the cost to reroll it again. Let's say I didn't get something I wanted. I was looking for a specific stat and it went from 5,000 on the first roll to 28,000 on the second roll. So be very, very careful about rerolling gear. The first taste is cheap, but after that, dude, this gets it's expensive so fast it's up exponentially so it went from 5,000 on the first roll to 28,000 so be careful about clicking that a second time and you can just imagine what happens on the third in fact for science okay oh man we re-rolled it we got eye shards which would be great if we were using it but we're not now our one percent attack speed went to 3.9 so 
we were rewarded for our efforts here, right? 1.8, 3.9, pretty good up. And the next roll is going to be 33,000. So actually it didn't go up quite as much as I figured it would, but it went up. It's still very expensive, especially relative to the amount of gold we have at this level. That was nearly a third of my total wealth to re-roll that bad boy a second time. Pretty expensive, just something to know. Uh, legendaries, you can do the same thing here. Just a very powerful system. Being able to re-roll one stat on a piece of gear and try to get something that you need but they limit you heavily. They're not about to let you have deterministic crafting in this game. Not too deterministic anyway. They want you to have to find the good gear. They don't want you to make the good gear because that's what a Diablo game is. It's a looter. You're supposed to go find loot, kill things, get loot. And that is everything for the occultist. You can see he's incredibly powerful to recap. You can imprint aspects to create legendaries out of rares or to change the aspect of a legendary you have. You can extract aspects from legendaries you find to imprint them onto a legendary you have or a rare you have. Uh, you can craft keys for the dungeons, the nightmare dungeons that you'll be doing in World Tier 3 and beyond. And you can enchant items. In other words, roll one stat, re-roll one stat on them, but it gets expensive fast. So don't expect to be able to re-roll infinitely especially early on when you don't have a whole lot of gold to lose. And next up, we have the Stable Master. Stable Master is pretty straightforward. You can come here and you can collect your mount. They figure around level 30, you'll get far enough into the story that you will unlock your mount. So it is story gated. You can't just come buy it right away. And it's got different cosmetic looks that you can do. This is where you can come and change your mount's appearance. So you go to Bardings and comparison, you can apply different looks, right? Oh, look, doesn't he look fancy now? Yeah, or does he want to look like this? Oh, what a look, right? So there you go. And you can also put trophies on them. I don't have a trophy to show you yet, but it would be like something hanging off the side of the mount. See this rope? That's where your trophy hangs from. And you can collect different trophies and get some extra fashion. The first one that we were able to collect from the beta was a Shava's uh, like horn. I guess it was a horn or something. It was a horn or some appendage and it's going to be hanging from your horse. The next one we're going to talk about is the alchemist. Really, really important. You can talk to the alchemist and you can do a lot of stuff here. One thing you can do is upgrade your potions. So while you're out in the world, you'll see little bushes you can interact with. When you see one of these bushes, always do. It takes one second. There's no cast time or like no channeling time to interact with a bush. You just click it and it instantly pops off and you just pick it up. That shrubbery is what you're going to use to upgrade your potions. So you come here, you start with the level one potion and then at level 10, you can upgrade it which nearly triples the upfront healing. And then it nearly doubles it when you upgrade it again at 20. And then at level 30, you can see there, it tells you which materials you're gonna need. And it's gonna heal you for 141 life and 35% over three seconds. So it's saying I need the gallow vine, the bite berry, and the crushed beast bones, which I have enough of, but I can't get to 30 right now in this part of the beta. So I can't click the upgrade button, dang it. But you can hover over the future ones and see exactly what they're going to do. The constant is the 35% of your life over three seconds on top of the burst. So every time you upgrade it, it's that burst heal that you get up front that is being improved. And you can see it goes all the way to 90 here because the maximum level in this game is 100. Next, we have craft elixirs. Elixirs have a buff and then an XP buff. They always have an XP buff and a buff. So weak assault elixir gives us increase the attack speed by 7% and 5% uh, experience for 30 minutes. And it's going to cost us, it tells us right there, Gallo Vine and Lifespan. So that's actually a pretty powerful one for like a melee character that wants 7% attack speed. That's a long buff, 30 minutes. But you can see there, I don't have a lot of Lifespan. So it's not the easiest materials for me to get this early in the game. I wouldn't be able to use this constantly. But you might look for one like this one where I have tons of Bite Berry, tons of Gallo Vine. I could theoretically keep this one up all the time. It would increase my cold resistance, but, and give me that 5% bonus XP. So if you wanted to try to take advantage of the 5% bonus XP, you could try to have one of these ticking at all times, you know, but honestly, 5% is next to nothing. That's like one extra pack of mobs. It's not a big deal. I wouldn't stress having this up and running at all times. Maybe if you get to a boss that is absolutely murdering you with poison damage, you come down here and you grab the poison resistance one and you put it on for that boss fight. So you're taking 15% less poison damage, that sort of thing. Next, we have refine resources. Let's say you're missing one of those resources, right? You have a ton of something else. Like I have a ton of iron chunks, but I need silver ore. I could come here and I could refine the chunks into silver ore. So if you ever find yourself with a large imbalance of one material and you're in need of another one, you may be able to come here and convert a material you don't need into one that you do. And then finally, we have craft incense. Crafting incenses are party buffs. So what you do is you craft an incense 
and then you get together with your group of friends or by yourself and you use that incense and it's going to give you and every person in the group a buff the more people in the group the better the buff is that it gives so you might have incense parties with your friends for instance there's the chorus of war incense that increases all player stats by 40 and your crit and overpower damage by five percent for every nearby player so it's a nice little buff for you and your group very nice to have now the last nbc in town that we're going to talk about right now is going to be the purveyor of curiosities this is where you come to gamble this is a really really fun NPC merchant in this game and a great way to hyper focus legendaries for a specific piece of gear. Let's say you're out there farming gear and you have a legendary in every slot except in your gloves. You just can't get gloves to drop. So you can come in here and you can keep buying gloves until you get a legendary. So we'll buy some right now. Maybe we get lucky. We didn't get the legendary we wanted, but had we, we would have been able to equip that legendary or extract the legendary aspect from it. Let's say we got a good aspect, but about a roll. We could extract that and put it on the gloves we have if we wanted to. Well, here's the strategy for using this merchant. One, at the very beginning of the game, you're not going to have very many legendaries at all. Like in this case, I'm missing legendaries in quite a few spots. So I would start by gambling on the cheaper ones, the cheapest right now being 40 each. So you gamble on the cheap ones and try to get those filled out. So maybe try to get these gloves because I can gamble on pretty easily and get a nice good legendary aspect in there. Whereas the weapon costs almost twice as much at 75 for a two-handed weapon. You're only going to be able to gamble a few times before you're out of obols at low level. It's going to be really unlikely you get what you're looking for by gambling for this. Whereas you have twice the likelihood of getting what you're looking for by gambling on the cheap stuff. Unless you know exactly what aspect you're going to be looking for, the first thing you should gamble on is whatever has the lowest item power. Because it's theoretically the worst item you have. Like if you see an item that is falling way behind in item power, like... My weapon right now is 326, but my jewelry is, let's see, this one's 279, this one's 232. So this is a good candidate for replacing it to get a better roll on my stats because these stats are being inhibited by its item power. If it was higher item power, these stats could roll way better. So you would start by rolling any item that had no good stats for you or any item that had a really low item power. All right, now let's talk about world tiers. What are they? What do they mean? What do they do? And how do you advance through them? When you first start the game, you're going to be given an option to choose between World Tier 1 or World Tier 2. World Tier 1 just basically being easy mode. I think it's there to give players that have never played an ARPG a chance to learn how to play an ARPG. Or, for instance, maybe you're just having a really bad luck. Maybe your build's not coming together. You're struggling on a boss in World Tier 2. Well, then you can knock it down to World Tier 1, kill the boss, and then go back to World Tier 2. So how do you do that? What does it do? Right here, there's a statue in town. It's called World. It's called the World Tier Statue. It's this icon right here. You come and you walk up to it and you'll see it says select a difficulty. You've got adventurer or veteran. These are the two you start out with. That's one of the first choices you make when you start the game. The difference between them is adventurer is just that's what it is. One to 50, you can do this. Enemies are easy to defeat. Veteran, it's from level one to 50 again, but enemies are more challenging. Monsters give 20% increased experience and monsters drop 15% more gold. Now, this is not a super incredible amount of XP and gold. I mean, 20% is 20%. You're leveling one fifth faster, right? That's nice to have, especially if you're killing the mobs quickly. But if you're killing mobs 20% slower or even 50% slower because you're struggling in World Tier 2, then you're really not gaining much by being there. So don't beat your head against the wall if you're not having fun in World Tier 2. Don't feel bad about going to 1 until you find some good gear or some good aspects you know, something to make your character really shine. Sometimes all it takes is one item before you're just like speed clearing dungeons. The next tier is going to be World Tier 3, unlocked by completing the campaign and Cathedral of Light Capstone Dungeon in Kiyavashad, World 2 Tier Veteran. So what does that mean? It means that you beat the story, then you turn it to World Tier 2, and then you go to the dungeon on the map marked with that symbol, and you complete it, and you will have unlocked World Tier 3. Now, what do you get for unlocking World Tier 3? Sacred items and unique items can drop. Sacred items are basically items that are on average better than you can get in World Tier 1 and 2. Items no longer have item power at this point. If you find a really good unique at this point, you can theoretically wear it for the rest of that character's life. It's no longer the case that just because you're leveling, an item isn't going to be very good. Unique items are designed as pinnacle items for very specific builds. 
These can be build defining items. They're extra, extra powerful. They can be a massive turning point for a character and a massive power spike. Unique items are exceptionally rare and hard to find. They're going to be really rare in World Tier 3 and slightly less rare when you get into World Tier 4 Torment. Now that you're in World Tier 3, Nightmare Sigils can drop and these unseal nightmare dungeons. These are the keys I was talking about when we were over at the occultist, the keys that you can craft and salvage so that you can create more keys. You can use these to get into nightmare dungeons. What are nightmare dungeons? They're harder versions of the existing dungeons with better loot inside. There's also some other really cool features. When you complete a nightmare dungeon, there's a chance that you'll find a higher tier of those sigils inside of that nightmare dungeon. It kind of reminds me of Mythic Plus in World of Warcraft. So if you get a higher tier sigil, then you can do a higher tier dungeon, which will then allow you to get an even higher tier sigil and so on and so forth. These sigils have affixes attached to them. These are extra mechanics that you'll have to deal with while fighting your way through the dungeon. The higher the tier of the sigil, the more affixes that you'll have to deal with while fighting your way through it. You cannot throw your body at these dungeons. If you die too many times, you fail. Tier one dungeons will allow you to die 12 times, but in the highest tier dungeon, you can only die four times. So you're not going to be able to go in there and just die over and over until you get your way through it. You need to be ready for that content before you go in there in order to complete it and get your reward at the end. Well, of course, hardcore players are going to have to do this without dying at all. The main reason for leveling up a nightmare dungeon is to level up your glyphs. Glyphs are an item you socket into your Paragon board and once leveled up, will be one of your most substantial sources of power in your Paragon board. So you'll have to find the right glyph and level it up. If you played D3, this probably sounds very familiar to running greater rifts and upgrading those legendary gems at the end. It's a lot like that, but way more complicated as it's going to have to be strategically slotted into your Paragon board rather than into a piece of jewelry. So you'll collect nightmare sigils to unlock nightmare dungeons, which will allow you to farm glyphs. The higher tier the nightmare dungeon is, the higher the nightmare sigil that will drop inside of it and the higher you can upgrade your glyph while inside of there. Another thing that unlocks is hell tides. Hell tides are great because they allow you to target farm specific item drops. So if you know you need a pair of boots and that's what's going to make your build work and you're still missing it, hell tides are going to be perfect for you. Hell tides also give crafting materials. But what is a hell tide? A hell tide basically takes over an existing zone in the game and causes random hell tide specific events that spawn in that zone. These events are different from the normal events. On top of that, there will be roaming bosses wandering around the hell tide. Hell tide zones are going to be quite a bit harder than the normal versions of those zones, so be careful. The way to approach these hell tide zones is to go around killing enemies to collect a currency called cinders. Once you've collected enough cinders, there will be chests located within the Helltide zone that you can open with those cinders. So those cinders act as a key for the chests. These chests have an icon over top of them indicating whether it contains weapons, jewelry, armor, etc. This is where you're allowed to target farm the item you want. So you can collect these cinders and then you can focus on opening the chests that are dropping the specific piece of loot that you're looking for. You'll want to be especially careful in these Helltide zones because if you die, you'll lose half of your cinders. They'll be deleted from existence. So don't die while you're in there. As of right now, hell tides will last one hour and will occur every other hour. So it'll be an hour on and then an hour off. Another lovely thing that comes with Nightmare is the existence of champion monsters with damage resistance auras. So if you're a fire mage, you might run into a monster with fire resistances, causing you to have to kill it with maybe your cold abilities or something like that. You might remember these types of monsters from Diablo 2. On top of that, enemies are more formidable in this difficulty, of course. Monsters give 100% increased experience instead of 20% in the previous one. And monsters drop 15% more gold and monsters overcome 20% resistance. So what this means is if you're in veteran and you have 60 fire resistance, when you go to nightmare, you're going to lose 20% of your resistance. You're going to only have 40% fire resistance. And it's going to be very important to keep your resistances capped if you don't want to die. So you're constantly going to be having to add more resistances to your character as you work your way down the difficulties. Finally, we have Torment. Unlocked by completing the Fallen Temple Capstone Dungeon in Northeastern Dry Steps, World Tier 3 Nightmare. What you'll do is you'll spend a lot of time in World Tier 3 Nightmare, leveling up your character, collecting gear, getting more powerful, and getting to level 70. At level 70, you'll be allowed to attempt to complete the Fallen Temple. This is going to be very difficult. It's not going to be a pushover content. Uh, this capstone is said to be quite difficult, so be ready for a challenge as you try to make your way there, especially if you go in 
before your character is ready to do so. You do need to be level 70 for this. And the new thing is ancestral items and new unique items will drop. Ancestral items are even more powerful legendaries than the regular and sacred legendaries. So each time you go up, you're finding legendaries that are more powerful than the previous level of difficulty. These are gonna be quite rare but not as rare as the new unique items that can drop. Unique items start dropping in Nightmare, but there are some uniques that will only drop in Torment. And you can count on these uniques that only drop in Torment as being really, really good. I imagine the uniques that will drop in here will be the ones we remember from Diablo 2, like the Grandfather, the Wind Force, things like that. Those best in slot uniques that you dream about having someday. In this difficulty, enemies are even more fearsome, of course. Monsters are going to give you 200% increased experience. Monsters are going to drop 15% more gold, and monsters are going to overcome 40% percent resistance again that's another 20 percent on top of nightmare so you're losing 40 percent of your resistances if you used to have 80 now you have 40 if you used to have 60 now you have 20 so you're gonna have to keep filling up your resistances because the enemies are going to keep overcoming them to do more damage to you now when we were talking about the nightmare dungeons we touched on a system called the paragon board you're going to be farming glyphs in the nightmare dungeons to put into your Paragon board. Each class is gonna get seven to eight Paragon boards. These have been compared to ascendancy classes from other ARPGs like Path of Exile. But basically each board is going to let you lean into a very specific build archetype. So for a Necromancer, one of the Paragon boards would be dedicated to a minion build. And you could grab all kinds of nodes that increase your minions life, survivability, damage, all that kinds of stuff. And these nodes are incredibly, incredibly powerful. In fact, some of these Paragon nodes are multiple times more powerful than a legendary power. So the Paragon board will be a path to absolutely massive power gains. Blizzard said the Paragon board is going to be one of the main places you go to make your build absolutely unique. One of the things we touched on was class quests. Your class quest will be a light blue quest that appears as a priority quest and the game will tell you to do it and you should. Your class quest is going to unlock your class system. Every class has a unique system and these systems are no joke. When you finish that quest and you've unlocked your class system, you are significantly stronger. Every time someone procrastinated on that quest, they're like, oh, I'm just going to do dungeons a little longer. I'll take care of that later. They regretted it because the second they did their class quest and unlocked their class system, they had a massive spike in their player power and they started cruising through those dungeons they were struggling with. Your character is going to be so much better as soon as you finish that quest. So go ahead and do it as soon as you're able to. It's going to send you off, get it done and feel the power gains. Once you've unlocked your class system in order to see it, you can go ahead and press Shift C on PC. Now, a really hot topic is going to be the Butcher because everybody's first encounter with the Butcher is quite the surprise and oftentimes fatal. The Butcher will appear randomly when you enter any dungeon. So what you'll want to do if you want to find the Butcher is just continuously run dungeons over and over until he randomly spawns inside of the dungeon that you're in. If he kills you, he will disappear. If you leave, he will disappear. When you run into him, you'll want to kill him if you can. And if you do manage to kill him, he's almost certain to drop a legendary item. So his legendary drop rate is really high. He's a really difficult battle. So if you fail the fight, don't feel bad. A lot of people are going to die to the butcher. He's a really fun fight, really powerful enemy, hits like a truck, moves like a train, and he slows you at the same time. Like he's just a really tough, but really fun fight. And you are handsomely rewarded if you manage to take him down, likely to get a legendary. At least I got a legendary every time I killed him. And so did the person I was playing with. And that was even with the reduced drop rates. Another great way to get legendaries is the Ashava and other world boss fights. World bosses will spawn on a schedule. And when one is up, you'll want to take it down at least once a week. Definitely. Because your weekly kill of the world boss will yield some really good rewards some legendaries, maybe some crafting materials. When you see the world boss spawn, you definitely want to go there and try to kill it. It is worth noting, you should probably be at least level 20 before you head over to a Shava. That's where this one spawns right here. So when you see a symbol pop up on the map here, if you're like level 20 or beyond and you haven't killed it recently, go over there, get that kill and get your legendaries. It's been dropping roughly one to two legendaries per kill while I was there. So getting that kill can be massive power gains for your character. Another cool thing about the game is let's say you're killing your way through a dungeon and you're running through here and you're killing a bunch of mobs and you forgot a legendary on the floor back here and didn't notice there will be a symbol on the map indicating that you left an item back here that was important, like a legendary, and you can run back and grab it. But fear not, 
the game is incredibly forgiving. If you forget a legendary item on the floor somewhere, the game will put it in your stash. So the next time you go to your stash, you'll see a missed items tab and you can go ahead and grab the legendary you forgot from there. So that should give you a little bit of peace of mind as you're sprinting through dungeons, killing things as you go. You don't have to sit there and wait and see what every mob drops as it dies and worry about leaving a legendary behind you. When you're in a dungeon, it'll give you a task to complete. Right here, it'll say, for instance, this one says, slay the bandit sentries, three. So there's three bandits in here that I would have to kill to complete this dungeon. When I kill the third one, it is complete. Sometimes it's just kill the final boss, Sometimes this kill all the enemies within. It varies from dungeon to dungeon. Occasionally when you're going through, you'll see an orange thing over here and that's an event going on. You'll start them and then finish them. And then when you finish it, it's going to give you a little chest. Radiant, radiant chest. We're going to get some murmuring obols. Those are our gambling currency. That's why we love to do these events. We love that gambling currency. It's giving us a ring, some crafting materials, and some gems. Right? And for completing this dungeon, I have unlocked Aspect Anemia. Direct damage against bleeding enemies has up to 20% chance to stun them for two seconds. Now, when you're done with the dungeon, you've got two options. One, you can click on this and your character will teleport out of the dungeon. Another option is to pull out your wheel and just click leave dungeon and your character will teleport out and they'll land right outside of the dungeon. Scroll of escape. What are these and why are they important? Unlike Diablo 2, you don't need them to teleport back to town. You can normally teleport back to town anytime you want just by hitting a button. The only downside with that method is that it has a long cast time and it can be interrupted. A scroll of escape also takes you back to town. However, it does so instantly, no matter what. You just open your quick slot wheel and you select it and voila, you have been teleported back to town. This will be an essential item in the hardcore player's toolkit as it will basically act as a get out of jail free card. It also prevents the need to have and use logout macros like hardcore Path of Exile players rely on. Pretty cool solution to a pretty unique problem in the ARPG genre, which is that sometimes death can become unavoidable and sometimes it's not your fault. For example, in the case of a disconnect. In such cases, if you disconnect while in a dungeon and you have a scroll of escape on your character, your character will automatically use the scroll of escape to save your character's life by teleporting you back to town. A pretty nifty system. Now let's talk about elites and champions. Elites will exist throughout the entire game, whereas champions will only spawn in difficulty world tier three and beyond. These mobs come with affixes, which we'll get into here in a moment, and are harder to kill than regular monsters while also giving you more loot and more experience. Elites can have anywhere from one to three of these affixes at a time, and for the full list of the elites and champions in the game, be sure to check out the written list at diablo4.justlootit.com and I'll have it linked down in the description below. Here's a few to give you an example of what these elites look and play like. So when you're finding elites, you can tell what they are. If you hover over this one there, you can see the little symbol over his head and it's a little frost symbol and you'll learn what each one is, but until you do, you can just hover over them and then at the top of the screen there, it says cold enchanted. So as you can see, he's chilling me, which is just going to slow me. Here we can see that this one has vampiric and suppressor. So that's what those symbols look like. This one has vampiric multi-shot and mortar. So you can see the symbols kind of make sense for what they are. Uh, once you've seen them and once you've seen them a few times, you'll learn them real quick. You know what you're fighting at a real quick glance. It's a nice way that they did this system. This enemy has terrifying, which is going to fear you. So if you stand in this circle, it fears you. You get the skull over your head, you run away. So if that starts happening to you, it means one of those guys is nearby. This guy has increased health. He's just thicker. Nothing special there. This enemy is shock lance. It's like the arcane beams from Diablo 3, but they're called shock lance in this game. This guy's mortar. So you'll see circles on the ground. You get out of them and then mortars fall into those areas that hurt. This guy's vampiric, which means when he hits me, It heals him. See his health go up there. This is the multi-shot guy. He's going to multi-shot. Pretty straightforward. This is poison enchanted. So every time he hits me, he's going to leave poison on the ground. See? You stand in the poison and it hurts a lot. This symbol means he's a waller. So you hover over him. You see it at the top there. And what that means is he's going to make a wall that's going to lock you in with him. And it's either going to be a you're trapped in here with him or he's trapped in there with you moment. What do you seem to understand? I'm not locked in here with you. <laughs> you're locked in here with me. Usually it's he's trapped in there with you, but sometimes there's a lot around. It can get pretty sketch. This mob is a teleporter. What does that mean? It just means he takes two seconds longer to kill.
because he teleports out of your damage. So another thing is really important in this game is your immune. So if I press four right now, it breaks me out of that stun that he has me in. Very, very important that you have an immune or an unstoppable ability on your bar. That's going to stop you from getting stunned and held in one place while you die. I mean, better yet is to dodge it altogether, but sometimes things don't go the way you want them to. Be careful from traps. They'll put status effects on you like that one right there. See the purple health bar? That means the enemy is vulnerable. You'll see the snares above my head, which means I've been snared. And you can see that I'm vulnerable because my health bar went purple. See that? That means I'm vulnerable. I'm taking 20% more damage. You'll find resplendent chests, which will have good loot in them. Hopefully. I have a better chance than normal. Dude, this is a shrine. You'll get these and they'll give you a buff to your character. There'll be a little symbol over the top of it that tells you what that shrine does. It's a cursed shrine, which means it's a shrine that isn't good yet, but it will be after you kill everything that spawns when you touch it. So those ones are a little bit booby trapped, but you know, they still give you great rewards at the end. And they tend to spawn a ton of enemies. So you might even look forward to the cursed shrines because it's... Lots of enemies, lots of kills, lots of XP, and they're pretty good finds. This is a healing well. You just interact with it to get back to full health. Sometimes it's cursed like that, and then enemies spawn. So what you'll have to do in this case is kill all the enemies, and then you can use it. And when you clear the shrine, not only will you be able to use it, but you'll also get a greater radiant chest, which will have some nice loot in it for you. And here's one of the shrines. It's a channeling shrine. What that means is you're going to have unlimited magic or resource, and you'll be able to cast it back to back to back, pretty much. Grab that. It also cuts your cooldowns by a significant margin. This is normally a 24 second cooldown, but it's knocked it down to a 9.13 second cooldown. Your skills have no costs and lower cooldown. As for the rest of the shrines, we've got artillery, which gives you 200% attack speed and summons holy arrows with every attack. We've got blast wave, which forms around you and explodes every three seconds, doing massive damage to everything nearby. We've got conduit, which makes all of your skills on your bar turn into surge, which basically turns you into a ball of lightning that deletes your enemies. We've got greed, which makes it so that every time you touch an enemy, it causes them to drop gold. The higher the difficulty, the more gold that they drop. We've got lethal, which increases your crit strike damage by 35% and also causes all of your direct damage abilities to crit all the time. Remember, dots cannot crit, so it won't work on those. We've got protection, which makes you invulnerable and unstoppable, which means you can't take damage, nor can you be crowd controlled. Then we've got the vampiric shrine, which will heal you upon damaging a monster. And that covers all of the shrines that we know about so far. Now in Diablo, you can group up with friends and there definitely are some benefits to doing that. One of which is it just makes the game easier. All the bosses are easier. I've spent a lot of time playing with group and solo. And basically what I found is boss fights are way easier. The scaling on them right now makes it so that if you have two to four people in your group, it's a hundred times easier than when you're by yourself, I guess, unless you're the person being carried. This is because a boss's attention is split between four people. So he's only attacking you one quarter of the time. You're taking one quarter of the damage effectively. You get to spend most of your time just wailing on him. So groups can make content easy. If you ever get stuck on a boss group up for it, you'll definitely be able to take it down. There's other benefits to grouping though, besides making boss fights easier easier. It's that if you're in a group with one other person, you get 5% bonus experience. If you're a group with two other people, you get 8% bonus experience. And if you're in a group with three other people, you all get 11% bonus experience. There's a little bit of an XP incentive. And then there's also the fact that it just makes difficult content easier. I will say that trash packs took slightly longer to kill. So while bosses were faster and easier to kill, trash packs were a little bit slower for me because my character can pretty much one shot trash packs that I walk up to. And when you have four people in the group, the mobs have four times the health. Chain reaction explosions are a lot harder to get to happen because everything's so thick and meaty. Of course, this is all going to depend on how geared out you and the people you group with are. If you're carrying three weak people through something, it's more than likely not going to be easier for you. So if you were looking to take advantage of all of the XP bonuses that you could at the start of the game, what you would want to do is get an elixir for 5% bonus XP. You would want to group with three other people for 11% bonus XP. And then you would also want to be on world tier two for 20% bonus XP for a total of 36% bonus XP when you start the game. It goes up fast. Then when you get to nightmare, that 20% XP changes to 100% XP and the 11% you're getting from being in a group is just not that useful, is it? But it might be useful for making those boss fights easier. A common question we get from players who are scarred by Blizzard's release of a game called Diablo Immortal is... 
is Diablo 4 pay to win? I'm very happy to say that right now, the answer is absolutely not. And hopefully it stays that way. Blizzard says it will stay that way and they plan not to have any pay to win in the game at all. All we can really do at this point is hope that they keep the word and hope that Diablo Immortal is the exception and not the rule, which leads us into the battle pass system. All right, next up, let's talk about the battle pass. There's basically three tiers of the battle pass. There's the free tier, which is the free track. And this is going to contain anything that's related to your account's power, anything that makes you stronger, as well as some other goodies. But basically anything that makes your character stronger is in the free track. And this is to prevent this game from becoming pay to win. So fear not, as of right now, this game is not pay to win. No power is contained within the battle pass. They successfully dodged that problem and avoided it like the plague because they don't want this game to be pay to win. So good on Blizzard for that. The first paid track is $10. So that's $10 for probably about a season, which is going to last about three months. So it's going to work out to about three bucks a month. This track is going to include roughly two outfits per class as you unlock it all. So if you progress your way through this track by completing the achievements and the zone completion and all the things that it requests you to complete, you'll unlock about two outfits per class. That's what you're paying the $10 for. Next track is $25. This is basically for the people that want all of the stuff in the $10 track but they want it faster so they want to skip the first 20 levels of the track and get those cosmetics sooner they can do that they can pay an extra 15 bucks for a total of 25 dollars to get the stuff the 10 dollar track gets but sooner now while it is skipping the first 20 levels of the track any of the power items related in those first 20 levels of the track will not be unlocked until you play the game long enough to unlock them naturally. So you can't pay $25 to skip 20 levels and get all of the power related items that are in the base track instantly. That's not something they're letting you do again to prevent pay to win from becoming a problem here. All right, now let's quickly go through the options to point out the really important ones as we go. So graphics has your graphics options, nothing too crazy here. This is really personal preference between you and what your computer can handle. There's not much else to be said about this. So we'll skip to the next section. Sound, same thing. This is going to depend on you and what you like and what you desire. Not much else here. You've got your voice chat options in here, however, in case you do decide to engage in the voice chat in game. Very useful. You've also got subtitles that you can turn on and off, screen reader, text to speech. Now, one of the interesting things that the sounds has is actually you can use it as kind of a loop filter. You can adjust this value here and have it notify you only when certain things are dropping. So like maybe you don't want to hear when a normal item drops, but you want to hear when magic or a buff drops or at some point you won't care about magic anymore and you're just going to want to know when rare drops or even legendary and beyond. So you can adjust this so that you can kind of cruise through the game, you know, and only be really hearing sounds for the items that you're looking for, those rares, those legendaries and beyond. Same thing here, play audio on ambient loop. You can turn this on and adjust the quality as well and play tar play audio on targeting objects. You can turn that on so that when you target an object, you hear about it. Um, next, we have gameplay. Screen shake is a really popular one for people to love and to hate. Comment flash, reduce strobing. If you're strobing averse, highlight players when obscured, you'll want this on so that when you're underneath the boss, you can tell where you are. This is great against the Shava. Show damage numbers, I like this. Show all tutorials. If you're brand new to the franchise, definitely turn the tutorials on so that you can learn some stuff. Now, Advanced tooltips and tooltip information are not on by default, but I think that you definitely want these on. This is what's going to tell you if you got a really good roll or a really bad roll on your legendary, right? A legendary will say, uh, it has a 26% chance for such and such to happen. And if you don't have the tooltip on, you won't know if 26% is good or not. So if you turn on the tooltips, these advanced informations here, like this one, it'll tell you that that 26 fell in a range of 20 to 80. And you're like, oh, wow, 26 is really bad. Or it might have told you it was between 20 and 30. And you're like, oh, it was pretty good. So this gives you more information that I think pretty much every player is going to want. They have it off to protect people, I guess, but turn it on. You've got your HUD configuration. You know, you can pick whether you want your skills in the left corner or in the center. It's up to you. 
item label duration on drop. You can adjust how long the text appears when something falls on the floor. You can also push to show items and adjust how your wheel works and stuff like that in here. Do you want to display minion health bars? Check this box. You can set your monster health bars to be always on and you can display player highlights if you want to. This can kind of gum up the game a bit if you turn this on. So I have it off. Next, we have our key bindings for keyboard and for controller. You can use either one in this game. Either one works great. Key bindings are very much personal preference. I will definitely recommend. The one thing I'm going to highlight in the control section is that if you're new to the genre, force move is really, really powerful, really effective, especially once you start getting into harder boss fights. Once you start doing world bosses, when you're needing to move, like when you want to move, your character moves, right? You don't accidentally click on an enemy and then have your character use a basic attack instead of moving, which will get you killed. I promise you, if you don't use force move to move, you're going to die because you were trying to move and you clicked on the enemy or the boss instead of moving the attacks and you die. It's going to happen. So use force move. I recommend it. And then bind your basic ability and your interact to something else. So you're using it like any of your other abilities. This is gonna save you from a lot of deaths if you do it early. If you wait until later, until you've died to a world boss 20 times because you meant to move, but you clicked and light attacked instead, it's just gonna be harder to learn. So I recommend changing this right up front to something that suits you, saving yourself the hassle of having to adjust your muscle memory, you know, 20, 40, 80, 100 hours into the game. Another thing you can do is force attack where you stand still and attack. So even though there's nothing there, if you hold shift and then do your basic attack, you will attack without moving or any attack. This will prevent you from accidentally trying to click on an enemy and running into them to attack rather than just shooting at them from range if you're trying to keep your distance. On PC, you just hold shift when you press the attack and that'll make sure that you stand still when you cast it. Social, this game is cross play and cross progression. Awesome. You can enable this so that you can play with other people on other platforms and communicate with them. Really, really cool that this game has both of those. So if you buy the game on console, you can play it on PC, but you will have to buy it on PC to play it on PC. Your progression is saved though. So you can play it on any platform that you want to buy the game for. You can adjust your notifications. Like if you don't want to know when your friends and your clan mates sign on, you can turn that off or on. You can modify your chat settings. You can turn chat bubbles on and off your head chat colors, you can have mature language filters and things like that, and you can block people. What I find interesting is that I have all of these people blocked, but I never told the game to block anyone. So I'm wondering how that happens. <laughs> so if you're one of these people, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to block you. Unless you were doing something mean where the game automatically blocked you for me, then I guess you deserved it. And then finally, there's accessibility, which, you know, gives you a screen reader, text to speech and things like that. Some visual clarity things like maybe you have a hard time seeing things. You can turn the font bigger or smaller. Same with your cursor. It's pretty common to make your cursor bigger in ARPGs because this little cursor can be really hard to find sometimes when you're fighting a big boss. So you can do this. And then it's got a colorblind filter. You can change your chat background, all of that stuff. And it's got a few other options in here as well. So definitely cruise through there if you feel like you need some enhanced visibility or maybe turn effects up, turn effects down, that kind of stuff. And that is it for the important options in the options menu. Okay, guys, thanks so much for watching. This video took a ton of work, so hopefully you found it helpful. If you did, be sure to like, sub, and leave a comment down below. It really helps a lot. Massive thanks to my YouTube members for supporting the channel. If you want access to behind the scenes footage and a private Discord channel, be sure to click the join button down below. If you love this video, you'll love my Diablo class guide popping up on screen right now. If not that one, check out one of the other ones that might suit you. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.